Right. Now. Oh, now we've got everybody coming in. Uh, sorry, we're just trying to get our talk amongst yourselves. Hi, everybody. We're just Hi everyone. We're just we're, trying to work out our technology. Yes, I'm just making sure that this is going across to our Facebook, and it says it it is, but I just can't see it anywhere. Oops, let's turn that off. You you and Grossy have a chat while so find out. <laughs> <figure anything here. laughs> G'day, Helen. <laughs> Everybody, this is Peter Gross that we've got here tonight, uh, ch Australian cheese historian, <laughs> and, uh, amazing storyteller. <laughs> Sometimes a little bit too long, but uh, <laughs> haul me in if we go uh, if we go overboard. <laughs> oh no, it, we've got um, quite a few cheeses to get through tonight. So. Um, 11, 11 cheeses, because we're yes. talking about two different um, therapy boxes that um, people have. So, um, yeah, it's going to be quite a few to get through. And for some reason, technology is coming to me. I can see Geraldine from Brisbane said hi. Oh, right. nice. oh, hi, Geraldine. Sorry. <laughs> Why can I not see that? Do I need to click I'm on? amazed that I can. Radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. with, my, with my genius on uh, electronics. <laughs> okay, how are you going there, Sam? <laughs> yeah, you guys, you guys just start, and I'll. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. So you guys just dive into it. So hi everybody, I'm just trying to get our Facebook Live feed going. I don't know why it hasn't gone across, yeah, normally. but um, normally it does. Sometimes yeah. it does, sometimes it doesn't. But we've got some beautiful cheeses to get mm. through tonight. Uh, I think we've got about eleven. So we'll yeah. try and sort of bang through a lot of these. Uh, because everybody's got their therapy box uh, pack. Mm. There's a lot that went out oh, this week. 1,500 boxes this week. Wow. Um, and I just want to say to you, um, everybody <laughs> watching and listening, um, if you would like to ask a question, please just you either use the chat function uh, or you can raise your hand um, and we can uh, see you and you can go live and ask us a question. Um, yeah, and yeah, if you've got a question for Grossi, you've got a question for us, um, or you can chat amongst yourselves and comment on the cheeses and um, we'll have some fun. <laughs> so um, what do you reckon, Pete? You reckon the halloumi we'll talk about first, the Lardisan halloumi? Look, I think that's probably a good idea, Helen, particularly if, if people have got these cheeses in front of them and they're sort of wanting to identify them as we go through them and maybe even have a taste. Um, then we'll probably start with the Lumi, that just being probably the mildest cheese. Um, hopefully you've all got a, a glass of something to, uh, to go with it. Um, I would say, obviously, that certainly at the start here, if you've got a champagne or something like that would be the best to start with. But um, so the Lumi is a very traditional cheese, originated, we think, from probably Cyprus. Um, and also traditionally made from goat and, and sheep milk. And that, the reason behind that is because, uh, as in a lot of places through that Mediterranean, uh, and certainly particularly Cyprus, um, sometimes the, the land quality isn't fantastic. It's certainly not comparable to, uh, to say, Gippsland, where we know a few cheeses that we talked about tonight come from. Um, and so with uh, cows absolutely demand huge and good quality pasture, whereas goats and sheep will, will virtually live on anything. So that's why most cheese that was ever made all around the world was always goat or sheep cheese originally. Um, and this is obviously no exception. Uh, however, this one is made by La Artisan. Uh, Matt Howe is a fantastic guy. He's a French guy, three generations um, of cheese makers in the family and uh, came out here to, uh, to Melbourne and set up a cheese place. Because he, 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 like, a, I suppose, the history of other cheese makers here in Australia, or the boutique ones anyway, they can never find the cheese that they love so much back in the home country, and so they started making it here, like Heidi and some of these places. So um, uh, he started making these down on the Great Ocean Road. He uses 100% organic milk. Um, also, Sam, I think something that we haven't mentioned in any of the other broadcasts is that it's all ARF. ARF, which is? ARF, which is Animal Rennet Free. Ah, mm -hmm. yes. Now, we actually get asked this question a lot, whether yeah. the cheese is vegetarian. Right. Okay. So, 
the, to, to make a cheese vegetarian, uh, it, it depends on the source of the rennet. Rennet is the enzyme that coagulates the, the marvellous milk and turns it into cheese. And uh, you can either have an animal-based rennet, which is the traditional way, or you can have a plant-based. Now, the plant-based ones, just so that you're not concerned about, you know, um, uh, gen uh, modifications or anything like that. It's uh, it's from a thistle, basically, is where most of the uh, the rennet, plant based rennet comes from. So, and like all Australian cheese makers, they all use animal based rennet, whereas most of the European people still are tr very much traditional and using the animal based. Um, so this guy has been making some fantastic cheese down along the Great Ocean Road for a number of years now. Um, and he's branched out and gone into into halloumi now. As I said, this is a bovine or cow-based halloumi. It's not uh, sheep and goat, but it is really good. Um, I think the trick to halloumi is most people barbecue it or fry it or something like that. You can eat it raw in its in its current state, straight out of the brine. And in fact, in Cyprus, um, the 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 uh, halloumi is often stored for up to two years in the brine. So, you know, here in Australia, we would absolutely panic about something like that, but <laughs> um, it's it, it probably in, in wooden, uh, you know, barrels, which is probably even more dubious. But anyway, um, it's a fairly robust cheese, but you would bring it out to, to eat, which is what most people do, uh, and cook it on a fry pan or something like that, over a medium heat, and honestly, it only takes a couple of minutes. I personally wouldn't put any olive oil or anything like that in it. I'd use a nonstick fry pan um, and I'd be looking at maybe two minutes on one side, a quick flip a minute on the other side until it's got that sort of golden brown on the outside. And that would be enough. Excellent. I see Kristen uh, Mouse is frying some halloumi up mm, right now. Yeah. Now, yes. believe it or not, I finally got our Facebook Live <laughs> uh, video stream going. So to everybody joining us right now on Facebook, on our Cheese Therapy Facebook page, welcome. You're with Peter Gross, uh, the one who's just walked in from the paddock after milking his cows. Uh, and there's That's Anne Bellin and point. myself, my name's Sam. Hi, <laughs> oh, we um, love, we love so, stirring so, Grossy. Uh, so Pete, your sister Kathy is listening. She says hi. Oh, truly. Oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, it's the only way they can communicate because Pete just won't pick up the phone and call. Now, there's a... <laughs> <laughs> it's too tight. There's a message from Kath Wilson asking about the halloumi because she doesn't have it in her pack. So tonight we're actually talking through eight, uh, sorry, 11 different cheeses because there's two different therapy boxes. So yes. if we're talking about a cheese that you don't have and you're a bit confused, um, that's, that's the yeah. reason why there's two different packs. That but it gives you the knowledge of some brilliant mm. cheeses that, uh, that Australian cheese makers are making because mm. pretty much, or pretty much, every single cheese that uh, is in the therapy box is made by some of Australia's best cheese makers. Uh, they're all beautiful cheeses, mm. why we cho chose them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're just perfect. So if it's not in your pack, don't worry because it's something for you to keep an eye on yeah. Uh, and you'll get tonight a lot of the, that back here and background story. And, and just one other thing, uh, Sam, if I can just also put in there, not only are you sampling some fantastic Australian cheese, but you're also helping out our Australian cheese makers because quite honestly, at this time, uh, they are very stressed. Um, you know, they, <clears throat> excuse me, most of their market, in fact, probably, you know, upwards of 80% of the produce that they make goes into what we call food service or, or the horrica channels, which is, you know, restaurants and, and what have you. And of course, that has just come to an absolute uh, stop. Uh, and so there is no way that they can get into their magnificent product to market. So this is where Sam and Helen have come in and, and doing these packs and, and to you marvellous people for buying these packs. Uh, it does a huge effort to help these uh, these, uh, you know, artisan cheesemakers around Australia because it's still in its infancy in, in Australia. We, uh, we tend to think we're, we're a sort of a agricultural based economy in, in some ways, uh, but we're nothing like the rest of the world. Um, I, I was only speaking with Will Studd last night and he was saying that, that we kicked off our boutique cheese industry here in Australia long before the Americans did. But the Americans now would uh, are just enormous compared to us. There would be 50 times the amount of cheesemakers over there, obviously a large population. 
Um, and an American cheese last year won the best cheese in the world, which was, uh, which is if anyone's ever eaten cheese out of a can <laughs> in America, or it's that bright orange, that terrible stuff, then it's quite an achievement, I've got to tell you. But anyway, they do make some great product. Yes, yeah, they yeah, certainly do. So now let's, we've got a lot to get through. So let's, mm. let's start with, we just covered that halloumi. Now let's go to some of our soft cheese. And I reckon we go straight to Tarago River mm. because their triple cream is absolutely divine. Yeah. Yeah, look, it is. Um, so that, those that don't know, uh, Tarago, and it's not Tarago, which is the Toyota, it's Tarago River. Um, it's near near and south in um, in Victoria. It's about an hour and a half drive, I suppose. It's at the base of the Great Dividing Range, uh, and it is absolutely prime dairy country. It's owned uh, by Laurie Jensen and uh, David Johnson. Their grandparents came out to Australia from Denmark um, in the late eighteen hundreds and started dairy farming. They were pretty uh, confident with, with that all through the 60s and the 70s until uh, England decided in 1974 to opt out of Australia and join the EU, the, uh, the, the thing that they're constantly trying to get out of right now. Um, and overnight, our dairy industry finished. So we went from about 88,000 dairy farms in the late 60s to about 6,000 farms now or less. Um, and in the early 80s, some of these farmers decided that they were either going to go bust, lose the family farm, or they had to value add their milk some way. And so Laurie Jensen was probably the very first of these farmers to start to make cheese with a guy called Richard Thomas. He made Gippsland Blue, a very, very famous cheese. Um, and he's been in continuous uh, production ever since. So his triple cream is, is a great Australian triple cream breed. Um, for those that don't know the difference, you know, you have a camembert, which is probably or generally a single cream cheese. A brie generally is a double cream and this is a triple cream. So much more butterfat, much more fat content in it um, and a delicious cheese, as Sam said. Mm. Yeah, it sure is. It sure is. Um, so following on from that, you know, I, I just think that the perfect drink for that has to be a champagne. What do you reckon, Grossi? Well, there's nothing in the world that is better than champagne, so I would say that. Um, particularly with these lighter flavoured cheeses, um, you know, something that's got carbonation in it, I think, is, is the best. The carbonation on the tongue just enlivens the tongue, makes it ready to accept the, the next delightful morsel you're about to take. So champagne would certainly be my, my preference. You know, you could try many things. Rieslings and um, and Chardonnays, whatever you like, but uh, certainly a, a, and and let's not forget beer. Um, you know, the, the carbonation in beer has the same effect. It also helps. I would go though for a lager. I wouldn't go to well, depending on the ales. But I, I think you know most of these Australian ales that that have this galaxy uh, hop in it these days makes it really uh, what's the word? It's not so much spicy, but citrusy. And I'm not too sure that would complement the, the cheese all that well. No. So in your tasty notes, so you can see we've got the Tarragon triple cream here. Now, when I, when I write these, I always like to do a bit of a background, like what Grossi is talking about here. But also we have some of the other things on each of the cheeses we do this how long they've been aged, what you pair it with, you know, food and also drink. Uh, and then a little... Fact of the day. So this one, I've got a Gippsland fact of the day. Uh, yes. And I, I, I must have uh, been out of enthusiasm with that <laughs> one because I'm talking about the minerals in the soil. <laughs> I know, but look, <laughs> it's, that day. <laughs> it, it's a really important point. You know, it, 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 that's what the French call the toir. And, and that's, in all honesty, what gives the cheese its taste. It is the minerality of the soil, it's the, the, the soils, it's the amount of rainfall, it's the type of grass, it's the type of beast that's being milked, that all add up to, to making that cheese different and unique to that very area. So that's no, a really good point, absolutely. Gee, you saved me in that one, Crossy. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, let's get on to Milawa. Now, Milawa, another one, just like Tarrago, you know, really uh, one of the pioneers of the, the artisan cheese making scene here in Australia. Uh, with David Brown, obviously, and now his daughter, Credwin, leading the way and fighting the charge to, to be uh, one of Australia's great artisan producers. 
and and absolutely succeeding in that. I've, I've known Brownie for over 40 years. Um, he started up, for those that don't know, Millawa is on the way to the Victorian ski field, so to Hotham and Falls Creek. Um, Brownie is a young fellow, used to uh, go up there every weekend skiing and decided uh, that he wanted to make some great cheese. And so once again, that name Richard Thomas comes up and the two of them collaborated to, uh, to start the Millawa Cheese Company. Um, if you, certainly, if you're ever up that way, I would encourage you to call in. It's, uh, it's a fantastic place. Coincidentally, opposite Brown Brothers Wines, uh, absolutely, although it's David Brown and Brown Brothers Wines, they're not related, uh, but a fantastic part of Australia and, and particularly Victoria to go and visit. They're making great cheese, have done for uh, a lot of years now. They also started producing in the 80s. Uh, and this is a camembert. So like we were talking before, it's a single cream cheese, but really nice. For those that don't know, a camembert, just to give you a little bit of history very quickly, was generally about 160, 200 grams in size. Invented in probably 784, somewhere around there by a lady. In so about this size, yeah? Around about, absolutely. So, I mean, in fact, I've got, if anyone can see that, that is a mould uh, for a camembert. Um, so, um, and in fact, when I was on King Island for quite a few years, we, we made our original camembert out of um, out of PVC drainage uh, tubing before we <laughs> put the pop and, stuff. and and the breezer out of the sewage line. So it was clean and it was never used. But anyway, um, so uh, but 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 camembert was uh, was was originally small. It it was in the north of uh, the western, I should say, Normandy part of France. Whereas a brie was always to the northeast of Paris, uh, the Ile de France region and was generally about three kilos in size. And that, in all honesty, is, is pretty much the difference between a brie and a camembert. There you go. Yeah. So now, there are yeah. other cheese that, uh, mm. that we've featured quite a lot over, the, over our four-year history is the King River Gold. Now, this one really is, a, I guess, a signature cheese of Millowa, uh, yes. and also sort of really, I guess, showcases David's uh, finesse yeah. of cheese yes. making. Look, his, his first cheese was a Miller Blue. That's where he probably gained his fame. But, um, but this is by far their biggest selling cheese, I would say, uh, to date. King River Gold, certainly during the 90s and the early 2000s, probably won more gold medals in Australia than any other cheese. It's a washed rind. So just so that we understand that a little bit more, uh, Camembert Brees and washed rinds are all from the surface ripened family. So the culture that we put in it, which is generally penicillin candida, which is that lovely white fluffy stuff on the outside, that ripens the cheese from the outside going in. So from the surface going in. If you ever cut a piece of cheese in half, um, and if you've got any in front of you, you will always notice that it looks very, very different, the cheese directly underneath the, uh, the rind of the cheese to what the cheese looks like in the middle. So. That's how it ripens. If there's a hard line in the middle with holes in it, that's generally called the, the chalk line, and that sort of shows that the, the cheese isn't all that mature and it's got a, got a way to go. But um, it's, um, it's, it's a great cheese. I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll love it. It's, it's got a pungent smell would be the, the, probably the, the best description of it, I suppose, and the fairest. But if you can get it past your nose, I think washed rinds are the way to go. They are just superb cheeses. Yeah. Now, Pete, sorry, um, that cheese you just held up, hold that up again. Oh, uh, yep, yeah, sorry, yep. Yeah. Now, that's a very white looking cheese. That does not look like it's been made out of cow's milk. Is that right? Good, that. great, great pickup, actually. And look, this is one, this is a, this is a bit of a first, never, never seen before, but this is uh, from, uh, from a guy called Barry at Barry's Creek, which we'll do a little bit later on when we do the blues. Now, now whilst, we're, whilst we're on this, Barry from Barry's Creek, probably Australia's most decorated uh, cheese maker, is actually going to be on here tomorrow night with our second Meet the Maker. So it's going to be great. But yeah, tell us about this the, cheese. This cheese. Okay, so look, this one you haven't unfortunately got in your packs, but, but as Sam said, there is a colour difference, and and it's a very important point. If you're if you're buying sheep or goat or, or cow cheese, and you're wondering why one is more expensive than the other, just very very quickly, uh, a sheep only milks about half a litre of milk a day. A goat about a litre to two litres a day. 
whereas a cow does in excess of 20 litres a day. So that's where the price difference comes in. But the most important thing is that there is always a colour difference. So goats, sheep and buffaloes can't process beta carotene, the green in, uh, in grass, and it bleaches their milk and makes it very white and subsequently the cheese very white. Whereas cows absorb that uh, beta carotene and it makes their milk very creamy and rich and that yellowy colour, not orange like in America, just nice uh -huh. and yellow and golden maybe is the, is the, is the most apt description. So. If you're ever buying that sort of cheese, just beware that uh, if, if a cheese is sort of starting to go to a yellow colour that we know in Australia as cheese, uh, and they're professing that it's sheep, cow or buffalo, it's probably got some cow in it to extend Sheep, it. goat or buffalo. Yeah, no sorry. cow. Yes. Yeah, correct. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, do you think it's time that we actually then talk about Barry? Because mm. particularly yep. his buffalo milk blue cheese. Now, this River is one of the most beautiful blue cheeses in the world, the River Iron Blue. Look, and I totally agree with you on that, uh, Sam. So just once again, just to give people a bit of an idea where he is, he's um, at Berries Creek is down near Wilson's Prom, so southern Gippsland. Um, a unique place, certainly the heart of, uh, of, of Victoria's, if not Australia's, dairy industry. He's only been down there, I would think, probably 10 years at this place, maybe even less than that. Um, but you're right, Sammy, he's Australia's most decorated cheesemaker. He, he rarely makes anything that isn't gold class or above. I think out of the last maybe six Grand Champion Cheese Awards in Australia over the last six years, he's probably won the Grand Champion four or five times. So he is absolutely amazing cheesemaker. But Riverine Blue, and not Riverine, Riverine is a type of buffalo, um, would be his most awarded cheese. Um, it's, so it's made from buffalo milk, so it's much more creamier than normal. Um, and is, if, you, if you're not particularly an enthusiastic blue person, and I would certainly encourage you to go down that path, I think they're brilliant. This is possibly not a bad one to start with. Tarago, who we talked about a moment ago, makes Shadows of Blue, which is also a great starter blue. Very, very creamy and very mild. But the, the Riverine is not strong as it sounds. It's, it's very pleasant, very rich, very creamy, and not, not at all harsh. <laughs> yeah. <I'm not> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, so that buffalo milk has a very small fat molecule, but also so much protein in it that it makes it just a, an amazing texture, you know, just mm. creamy and rich uh, without being sort of too over the top, like perhaps a a triple cream can get it's just it's just amazing and i think it's really good in the therapy box we've got uh the two blues in there are both barry's blues yeah. Here we've got the riverine blue of the buffalo milk and then the tarwin blue with the cow's milk and i think it's a really good way where you can actually compare them with the two yeah. different blocks and, and and you will notice oh well, i hope you notice that if there are you know distinctly different so the the tarwin um is going to be yellower and more golden, as I said, because it's it's a cow cheese. Um, I think there's also, there's a different mould that he uses or culture. Um, most of these cultures can be traced back still to the caves in, in Roquefort in France, where just about all blue cheese mould originates from. Uh, but the Tarwin is a very, very, <clears throat> excuse me, different cheese uh, and a completely different taste. Now, on the river on, if you do have them in, <clears throat> in front of you, you will possibly notice that it's slightly firmer, hence the higher fat concentration. And, and there's probably very distinctive blue lines possibly running through them. Um, there's a few myths about how you make blue cheese. Most of them are wrong um, concerning copper wires and what have you. But when the cheese is made into its original head, it goes and sits for about eight weeks to mature and firm up. The hoops that they were in are, are taken off, which is what we showed you before. Um, and then the cheese is pierced from the top and the bottom with stainless steel wires, sometimes even to the sides, which allows air to get into the middle of the cheese, which, which then reacts with the penicillin um, rock forte that we, the cheesemakers presumably put in when the milk was still in, in its liquid form. And it starts that magnificent blue veining uh, through the cheese. Yeah, beautiful. Mm. I, we just had a question from Cathy McLean. Why do we get one set of cheese rather than the other in the pack? Uh, the reason, Cathy, is because 
our, our cheese makers aren't what you call big cheese makers and mm. the demand from right around Australia has been so overwhelming mm. that uh, basically we've been buying as much as these small cheese makers can produce. You know, quite a, pretty much all of them have had to reduce their staff in some way. So by mm. buying as much as we possibly can, and why we're sort of tonight, we're talking about uh, five, six, maybe seven different makers because we're trying to spread your love. Uh, you know, the amount of passion that Australians have shown for the Australian dairy industry right now mm. has been outstanding. So uh, that's, what, that's why, you know, I think we're on to our sixth, seventh iteration, seventh, yeah. seventh iteration of the mm. therapy box. And that's only just in April. <laughs> that's only in April in three weeks. And it's basically mm. because our cheesemakers can only produce so much. We've done, how's this? Six tonnes of Australian cheese this just month alone. Uh, <laughs> one month ago, it was just Helen and I packing. <laughs> we now have 14 people. We've outsourced our cheese cutting to a lady with a catering company. She has five people cutting. Uh, all of our cheesemakers are able to keep quite a few of their staff on. The dairy farmers have been able to keep the milk flowing uh, straight to the, the cheese makers. Mm. You know, the therapy box is one of the most beautiful things. And this, uh, this Australian public reaction from everybody out there who has got one of these things, you little bloody rippers, <laughs> I love it. Um, you know, I get, the cheese makers call me every single day <laughs> they do and they usually actually. after a couple of wines or a couple of beers to sort of unload about how hard it is but also just how appreciative they are of everybody who has got the therapy box so kathy i hope that ex that explains why uh some some cheeses are different that we're talking about tonight it's just basically because mm. our, our little cheese makers are doing their little darndest to uh to produce and, for us and normally with our packs we do plan ahead quite a bit for um, what we're putting together. But because this month has been so massive and we've just constantly kept selling out of the pack, we wanted to keep it going and keep just doing mm. as much as we can. So um, like Sam said, we could have just only certain cheeses get our hand on a certain number There's for that pack, then move on to the next one and yes. clear all that cheese out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, so sorry, um, I hope that answers your question, Cathy. <laughs> Now we're talking about uh, Barry Charlton at, uh, at Berry's Creek, uh, who we have on Meet the Maker tomorrow night. And absolutely very passionate bloke. It'll be a very interesting chat. So tune in for that. Now, blue cheese, um, Pete, everybody wants to always match a red wine with a blue. Yeah, look, good point, Sam. Um, and look, and, and obviously I've been guilty of it too. And and, uh, and as we say on all these things, it really is up to the individual. If you want to have it with with a red wine, then by all means, that's uh, what you should do. My personal favourite uh, isn't, in fact, a big red. I think if you've got a magnificent big, say, Barossa Shiraz, which I do love, I find that the two tastes tend to, to fight each other. Um, and I don't think you're really complimenting either one. I think if you've got a magnificent blue, I think you probably need to go to either a sticky or a port to really get the best out of it. Now, not everyone likes stickies and not everyone likes port. Um, so, you know, by all means go for red and go whatever you like, um, but it would need to be something big to, uh, to combat a lot of blues. And, and when you get in this, into say rock or something like that, which is a sheep's blue, um, then I think that's really, uh, I think the, the, the reds are then totally out of it. And I'd be preferring to go back to a champagne, as silly as that may sound. I think the carbonation effect, again, uh, would lend itself much better than a, uh, than a red would. Yeah, well, you're sounding like Ruth Harper there, who's enjoying her first box with some bubbles. Good. Well uh, done. Ruth, on to it. Well done, Ruth. Well done. Um, and a late harvest Riesling. Late yeah, harvest no, that's for a really Beautiful, yeah. that sweetness really comes through. That would be sensation. In fact, that's, uh, yeah, I've, I've, got a, I've got an Alsace uh, in front of me at the moment, but I might change that to a, a late harvest. Sounds very good, I've got to say. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fantastic. So, where should we, where should right, we move? Where we Let's now? go. Mm -hmm. Now, I grew up here on the Sunshine Coast in a small town called mm. Wombai. 
Now, Wumbai, apart from being famous for me, <laughs> is also famous for the big pineapple. So everybody in the cold country knows exactly where I'm talking about now, mm. someplace on the Sunshine Coast. Mm. But what's happened over the last eight, nine years is this small little cheese uh, cheesery called Wumbai has just taken Australia by storm. They've been yes. winning awards everywhere. Thank heavens you've got known for something else other than the big pineapple. Um, <laughs> just as a quick, Come uh, on. Just as a quick little uh, side issue there, um, we, we're going to have to come up with a name for boutique cheese producers here in Australia. In, in France, they're called fruitiers, uh, and in England, they're called cremeries. Uh, we need to come up with our own little unique name. But um, Cheesery isn't cool. And it's probably not, no. <laughs> um, but look, uh, Mumbai is, a, is a, a great little spot. It's just to the west of uh, Noosa, for those that don't know about it, it's about 20 minutes west. Of Mooloolaba. Oh, Mooloolaba or, or Noosa, probably more people maybe know Noosa, but it is a lovely little spot, very tranquil, lovely green rolling hills, great daring country. And Graham and Karen uh, started their little enterprise up, as you say, only about eight years ago. They were both living in Singapore. Graham was very much a frustrated chef. <laughs> uh, they would see each other every weekend and Monday to Friday, they would be both of them uh, zooming off in all parts of the world. And he was sitting at home one Saturday, Karen was still somewhere around the rest of the globe. And he was watching on TV a, a, a show called Cheese Slices, uh, hosted by Will Studd. And Graham decided then and there that he was going to throw in his uh, job and go to, to uh, back to Australia to make cheese. And on the net, he found an idyllic little spot at, uh, at Mumbai and started making cheese. And, and in all honesty, as you say, it's only seven or eight years further down the track. This year at the Victorian Dairy Awards, uh, their ash brie was voted the best white mold cheese in Australia. Now, that's, that's no mean feat, I've got to tell you. Now, the, the ash brie, actually, I have that in the, there you go. Uh, the bacon great bacon. box. Yes. Yes, anyway, well, we can talk about that later. But okay. I, love, I love this cheese, it's beautiful. Yeah. It is great. Now look, just to, if I can go back quickly to my little mould here. Yeah. When, when cheese is first made, that's a, that's a mould and it's all in its curds and whey. The, the liquid, which is the whey we don't want, we only want the curd or the body. And, and the cheese maker fills this up with the curd so that it's over the top of the lip. And he, but after, a week, it goes, or even less than that actually, probably after 24 hours, 48 hours, it goes down to that little blue, that little black line that you can see, which is around about the size that most breweries and camemberts are that we know. So it starts off about that high, but just with no pressure at it, just with the force of gravity, it goes down to that size that we know them. Um, it's a great, uh, great cheese, all of the, 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 uh, the Wumbai products. Uh, and, and certainly you'll, you'll enjoy that. I would also urge you to get the, the bacon pack because the <laughs> ash one is absolutely brilliant. It really is. Yes, well, um, the interesting, you know, apart from uh, having a, a weird name, Bacon Great Box. So what I actually found was Australia's best bacon called Box Bacon down in Tassie. But we teamed up with a guy called Chris Hagen from The Long Apron at Spice's Retreat up in Melania. And The Long Apron is probably regarded as, you know, certainly one of Australia's top restaurants. Mm. And Chris is extremely great at using Australian produce to mm. come up with amazing uh, recipes. So, you know, we've, he's put together some recipes. So this is a uh, rack lead and potato gratin. Uh, then we've got the baked Mumbai ash brie with box bacon. Um, so some beautiful recipes. And uh, he uses Mumbai extensively throughout his, um, his menu up there at the Long Apron. He's a great supporter, I've got to say, as are all the spices resorts. Great supporters of Mumbai. Mm, fantastic. So now we also have their gold. Oh now, if we thought the ash brie was great, the gold. Yeah, it's so gold. It, it, it is, and it is gold. So the gold is is once again a washed rind cheese, which we mentioned uh, just before with the King River. Um, 
so just to uh, to sort of expand on that a little bit more, most of these cheeses start life as a camembert. So they've got the penicillin uh, candidum, the white mould on the outside. That is left to mature for, you know, depending on the cheese maker, maybe up to eight days. And then the cheese is washed, hence the name washed rind. Uh, and it can be washed in either must or, or mace. Um, or if anyone's ever been to England and had a stinking bishop, uh, it can be washed with apple cider. But most times it is washed with, uh, with just brine, which is a weak salt water solution. The introduction of another um, culture called a bee linen is, uh, is, is introduced to the cheese and that gives it that magnificent orange colour that goes on the outside of, the, of a washed rind cheese and it absolutely gives it that very pungent smell. Um, but as I said before, if you can get it past your, your nose, you're, you're right, the taste is great. No washed rinds made here in Australia are particularly uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, they're not particularly strong. They are fairly mellow. Yeah. It's not until you get to France, to the home of wash rinds, which is once again Normandy, the West Coast, when you get to the things like Eplace, that you really start to uh, to get into the, the really smelly. And, the... and just um, going back on your comment earlier, Pete, because we do get people a little bit afraid of the term when we call our cheese stinky. Yes. Mm. Uh, so, you know, as you were saying earlier, if you can get it past your nose, yep. then you're going to win because it might smell one way, but it's not going to taste that way. And uh, you will, you know, you'll be pleasantly surprised if you just let it yep. in your mouth. <laughs> totally without a doubt. Um, and as with all cheese, you should have taken it out of the fridge at least an hour before you want to eat it. Um, and by unwrapping it, that's not just taking it out of the fridge, but unwrapping it, putting it on your cheese board, um, you're also allowing that smell dis to, to uh, dissipate. So it won't be as strong, but it's, look, it's, it's going to have a sort of a barnyardy sort of a smell, but, um, but it's fantastic in all honesty. Just, and if you really, really don't like it, don't eat the mould, just eat the inside and you will love it. Yes. Now we got, we actually have Sandra Cadbury can be watching tonight, Pete, on... Uh, oh, on yeah, lovely. Yeah. So, part of, this is part of the uh, the Wumbai show. Uh, yeah, Wumbai one of the owners of Wumbai. Well done. Good to have and, you. Um, she's been quietly watching. Uh, <laughs> waiting. Come on, Sandra. Where's your... <laughs> thanks for plugging my cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we always plug Wumbai cheese. We love it. It's just... Yeah, it it is always... It's always on point. It's yeah. perfect. It now, absolutely is. Now, nice. I reckon, this is something I really want to talk about, is uh, quite an unusual one, which is the curd from Yarra Valley Dairies, which mm. is the saffy with the saffron, um, what do you call them? Saffron flowers? Saffron? Um, yeah. well, 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 saffron uh, is, yeah, it is, um, it, what we import saffron, saffron's about $2,500 a kilo at the moment. It's the, uh, the, the stem, or what, it's not the stem, it's the, uh, what's the thing in the middle called? God, Come, on. Come on, people, threads? No, no, it's not the threads. Oh, gee, I, I've got a mental blank, but anyway. Stamen. Stamen, Stamen, that's Stamen. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, we can crowd, that's the word. We can crowdsource this <laughs> yes, one. Yes, that's right. <laughs> when, when the old bloke uh, has a memory lapse. Um, and so this is used to, to colour and taste the, uh, the feta. So... Look, just a little bit, once again, on Yarra Valley, just so you appreciate where it's from. It's, it's about probably an hour's drive out of Melbourne. It used to be the fruit bowl of, or the food bowl, maybe, of Melbourne. Um, it's surrounded by mountains. It's in a little valley, obviously, Yarra Valley. An idyllic little uh, part of, uh, of Victoria, I've got to say. Obviously, a very big wine-growing area. We would know that from a lot of brands that come there. In fact... Uh, Moet and Chandon, their only other place outside of France that they uh, grow sparkling is uh, in Yarra Valley and they back on to the dairy, the Yarra Valley dairy. It was started by a lady called Mary Mooney in the 80s and she actually is the person that's responsible for coining the phrase Persian feta. Now, there, there has never been such a product ever in the world, but <laughs> Mary uh, started this back in the 80s and so if anyone's ever had Persian feta, that's from Mary's place at, uh, at the Yarra Valley. Persian, I don't know if you've 
yeah, hopefully you've all had it, but Persian feta, in my mind, is just about the best feta there is on the market. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, and this is almost a derivative of that. So it's, it's that same lovely mouthfeel for their feta. It's got saffron and, and garlic and cumin, I think, also in the, in the blend. And it's just really lovely. I would also urge you, if you're using it, to, to use the olive oil. Uh, as well, and if you put it into your fridge and that and it starts to sort of coagulate, that means there's good olive oil in it because olive oil, anything below sort of four degrees, should coagulate. It should never remain clear. If it does, then it's certainly not uh, olive oil. Mm. Yes. So Pete, um, we we often have beautiful feathers that we put in our salad here at home, and our kids fight over who's going to get the most feta out of the salad and we use the dressing over the salad. But yep. I've had a few people message me in the last few days asking me, what do I do with this feta? Because I think they um, aren't used to feta. And, yes. um, so how else can you eat a feta other than being in a salad? Being in a salad, look, good point. Look, I think one of the easiest uh, and best <laughs> little snacks is a little thin piece of, um, of say, a, a, you know, a bagel or a French stick or something like that, and a bit of feta put on top of that. By all means, put the oil on it. Don't be stingy. Let the oil, that lovely olive oil, soak into the, into the bread. Maybe, um, you know, slice a, a lovely little uh, round tomato, uh, in a, you know, one of the little blokes on it, and then a cracker pepper on top of that, and it's just fantastic. And... And if you've got guests coming around, I mean, it's so easy to do something like that. Really nice. Yeah, perfect. Now, Pete, I, let's uh, have one more cheese. Because I've got scrambled eggs I just saw. And that's a great, a, a great point from Jason. Jennifer, Jennifer Gale, I should say. Great point. Ooh, it, uh, how does that be? Mm, yeah. Yum. I could try that. Yeah, that'd be great. Now, let's talk about mafra because we haven't spoken about mafra mm. before. This yep. is really interesting. Look, I think it is. Um, so uh, it was started also probably um, the late 80s. Um, she, uh, her name, and I'm probably uh, making a meal out of this, Ferial Zachman, I think her name is, Zachman. Um, I think, once again, I'm not 100% sure, I think she's uh, of Hungarian descent, but she was tired of what she was doing in Melbourne. She was a chemist. Uh, and wanted to see change. And she moved down to Mafra, which is a gorgeous little town. It's in, once again, in uh, Southern Victorian Gippsland. But whereas Tarago and Yarra Valley are on one side of the Great Dividing Range, she's on the other side of the Great Dividing Range, the same size as, as Berry's Creek. Um, gorgeous little, uh, little place. And she has just been making cheddar and that's all. Now that's, that's very symptomatic of of most European uh, cranberries or, or fruitiers, that they generally concentrate on one cheese and one only. And she's made cheddar now. Cheddar, I've got to say, Sam, as you and I have had this discussion many times, there is cheddar and there is cheddar. <laughs> now, if you go into your supermarket, what you're buying in, in, the, in the supermarket is cheddar that is matured in a 20 kilo block in plastic it has Helviticus put into it, which is a fast maturing enzyme. If you know what you're looking for, you can taste Helviticus in just about every Australian cheese because every Australian cheese regard in a supermarket this season, regardless of what it says on the pack, is two months old. Okay, so hang on, Pete. So, so Pete, the cheeses in the supermarket that say aged up to 24 months. Yes. And up that's to, the, yes, that's the great catchphrase. You're See, so, you're telling me they're only two months. Correct. They're only two months old. That's the get out clause. That's sticky. Or if you look at other ones, they won't make any reference about an age on it at all. But through conditioning, we'll know that a yellow sort of label is, uh, is going to be mild. A green is probably going to be tasty. A red is going to be extra tasty. And a black, it's probably going to be vintage. But they never say it on the label. They let you make that, that uh, you know, that calculation, I suppose. So <laughs> it's, it's, you, you read the fine, like, or, or some of them will say this cheese will taste similar to a cheese that's 12 months old. Mm -hmm. That's the get out clause. Right. So just back on the cheddars, the way that um, 
that, that she makes her cheddars. And there's not too many other people that do it. King Island do it. Uh, Pine Garner do it in Tasmania. Ashgrove, who you featured before in Tasmania, do it. And, and Mafra do it. They make their cheese in cloth, in proper cheese cloth. It's bound in that cloth and that's how it matures for 12 months or two years, whatever the case may be. 50% of the taste of a cheddar cheese comes from its surround. So if it's in, locked in plastic in a, in a factory somewhere, uh, the only thing it's going to take on is probably diesel fumes or something like that. It's not <laughs> taking on anything else. <laughs> if one of these cheeses, if they're cloth made, uh, they are taking in all those lovely little cultures and what have you in the air all around. And that's what separates, for example, uh, you know, a, a cave aged cheese uh, to something else. So it's a big, big difference. And I'd urge you, have a, have a piece of, of cheddar from, uh, you know, that is absolutely cloth bound and you will definitely taste a difference. Yeah, it's certainly are that. Absolutely. The third one, just sorry, just quickly, the bit, the third type of cheddar, just in case anyone's interested, is club. Um, totally different cheese again. Mersey Valley is probably the most famous and that is just a conglomeration of, of maybe, you know, four or five other cheeses they couldn't sell. It's all pressed together to form a new, a new cheese. Sounds yeah. delightful, hey? Does it just not? <laughs> <laughs> well, Pete, well, I've got, a, uh, I've got a, a truck turning up shortly to uh, oh, offload awesome. some gel packs. Yeah. So I'm going to have to duck so, off in a little bit. That's our, that's our Friday night. That's, our, that's our Friday night. <laughs> yeah. um, now, uh, something I'd like to highlight to everybody, and I know that uh, a lot of people have been very frustrated with the Australia Post, as have we. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that it has been very disappointing to see so many people not have their cheese packs turn up. Mm. Um, what we're starting next week is for South East Queensland and Melbourne, we're putting on our own vehicles with our own drivers, delivering our cheese packs straight into your hands. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we've never uh, done this, but to be honest, we are so frustrated like you are. Um, so now for Melbourne, uh, you know, it means that your cheese will arrive later in the week. Uh, and also on the weekend, but but it'll be cold it's, and it's <laughs> it gonna, be... and it's going to turn up and yeah. it will be yeah. spot on. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's just a massive step for us as a very small company to put on our own fleet. We're doing we'll be doing uh, Sydney in a little bit as well. Yeah. But um, you know, for everybody who calls and emails us and sends us a message about their cheese pack not turning up, don't worry, we feel your pain. That's why we're taking these steps to address it because mm. it has been an absolute nightmare the last two weeks, three weeks for not just us, but anybody who's trying to deliver anything through the post or mm. any courier. Um, it has been very difficult and frustrating and yeah. caused us a huge amount of stress. So I just wanted to say that, um, you know, we're, we are doing our best and we're taking steps to address the issues that we have faced which haven't been as a result of us, but we're taking matters into our own hands. That's right. Yeah. There you go. Very good. <laughs> anyway, look, guys, we love cheese. We love and cheese. like everybody out there as well, you all love cheese. The thing is that right now, our cheese makers need your help. And that's what you've done. You've stepped up. You've bought the therapy box. And you have made the world of difference, not only to us, but most importantly, the dairy farmers and our little cheese makers. And the farmers all speak to each other. They know each other. They're talking about it amongst themselves as well as to us. It's really great. Yeah. yeah. And it's also great on, I've noticed on Facebook, cheese makers sharing other cheese makers <laughs> posts. Yeah. They're all supporting each other yeah. because you know what? We're all in the same shit show. <laughs> we just need to all, you know, work together to support each other. That's it's, right. yeah. it's not easy for a huge amount of people. And, uh, Everybody who's been supporting us has done an amazing job. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who's been sending photos of their cheese packs and yeah. their uh, cheese platters that they've been putting together. And also, if you're having and a cheese platter right now, send, send us, us a, a photo. photo. We, Put it on Facebook. We see them all. We love them. And we're saving them because um, we love them. <laughs> to put up on our bedroom wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs>
<laughs> There's a line there, but I won't go there. <laughs> uh, and also um, to everybody, um, please follow Peter Gross on Instagram, Big Cheese Brisbane, um, and um, ask him questions if you want to, because he has got stories to tell. And um, yeah, clear or not? Thank you, Helen. <laughs> If you've got another two hours, I'll keep going. <laughs> right, Pete. Well, thank you very much, mate. It's been such a pleasure. It's always fun having you on. Now, to everybody, tomorrow night, 6 p.m., we have Barry Charlton, the creator of River Iron Blue and the Tarwin Blue, Australia's most decorated cheese maker, will be joining us here for our very second Meets the Maker. Mm. I've set his technology up and he's primed. <laughs> he's probably still sitting there right now Panicky. waiting for his computer to turn on. <laughs> he's such a wonderful guy, yeah. such a passionate man. And I reckon everybody's going to really love to hear some of his stories. Yeah, it's going to be great. So, ladies and gents, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. No worries. Great. See you, everybody. Have a great weekend, everyone. All the best. Ciao. Bye. Ciao.